All right, off to our hymn. Off to our hymn. What am I talking about? Our first hymn, 774. 774, when the roll's called up yonder, let's all stand. Bibles and turn to the 95th Psalms. Psalms 95. The 95th Psalms is the Psalms of Thanksgiving. Some of us still look in our Bibles, so I'm trying to give you time. All right, sounds like you found it. Psalms 95 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Amen. Tim. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house and hear your word read to us again this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the Sunday school hour, Lord, where we studied about your word. I pray, Lord, that each one of us will take it and apply it to our lives, Lord, we we'll better Christians for you. Lord, we do thank you for this season we're representing right now, Lord, for Thanksgiving. Lord, we are thankful for all you've done in our lives, what you've done for this church. Lord, I continue blessing upon us that, Lord, we'll always be found doing things pleasing to you. Lord, I reach down. I ask you, Lord, to reach down and touch them, Lord, in our prayer list, God, that you just heal them, much they want it, they can get back about their business, Lord, and not only the ones that are sick, Lord, but the ones that are caring for them. Lord, just be with them as only you can. Lord, pray for our country. Lord, we just thank you for the, the, that we have a country to live in where we can serve you when we want to. Ask the Lord to continue a blessing upon us. Be with our leaders, Lord, that they'll look to you for guidance and everything they do. Again, Lord, we ask you to watch over us and care for us. Just let us say, leave this house today. It says it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Watch over and care for each one of us, Lord, and forgive us we fail thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated.
Good morning, y'all. Well, who had a good week this week? Y'all ate a lot of food? Mm-hmm. I know you did, buddy. I ate a lot of food with you, didn't we? Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Well, I figured this time, usually we do our, our children's sermon, Thanksgiving sermon, before Thanksgiving comes around, don't we? So I figured we wait till afterwards this time and read a verse out of Ephesians. It's uh, chapter 5. We'll start with verse 19. There's a couple of verses, and it says, Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns. I guess you could say sing. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the, and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did y'all notice that? It said giving thanks always. Did you hear that? Didn't say come in and give thanks on Thanksgiving Sunday, did it? No, it said giving thanks always. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays for obvious reasons. There's food everywhere. And my grandma makes the best pecan pie, and I get it twice a year, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I'm going well, to bust that three times a year. And I love that pecan pie. And I'm thankful for that pecan pie. I love Thanksgiving. But sometimes people get Thanksgiving a little bit confused, and I want to make sure we all understand something. Thanksgiving is a national holiday, a United States holiday, where everybody in the nation comes together at once to give thanks for what we have, right? It's kind of like just a day across the United States, across our great country, where everybody at one time stops to say thank you to God for the blessings that he has given to us, right? Us, as individuals and as a church, are commanded to be thankful always, not just on Thanksgiving Day, all right? We come together as a church three times a week, sometimes more, sometimes less, but three times a week to be thankful together at one time. And I go home with my family to be thankful with my family at one time. And sometimes when I'm alone, I can be thankful by myself, right? Right? Let's all be thankful on Thanksgiving. Let's be thankful for the awesome country that we live in, for the blessings that God has put on us, for the blessings that he has given to our country and our families and ourselves. So let's all come together on Thanksgiving Day and Thanksgiving Week, and let's be thankful right along with everybody else in the country. But let's also be thankful every other day of the year, every other second, every other minute, because I'm going to tell you something. God has blessed this country. He has blessed us, hasn't he? Yeah, is I don't know that there is another country in the world where you can take a week and sit down and see the amount of food that we have seen this week. I don't, I don't, I don't think there is, and we get to see it. So let's be thankful all the time. Deal. All right. Let's say a prayer and, and let's thank God. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, God, we thank you for this time of the year, Lord, where the whole nation stops, Lord, the whole nation stops to turn to you and say thank you for the blessings that you have given to this country, Lord. And you have blessed us so much. And God, we enjoy this time of year where we get to celebrate uh, with our families and with our friends and, and with the whole nation, the whole country, Lord, of, of what you have given for us or given to us. But God, we just pray that you help us keep a thankful heart all the time, not just at Thanksgiving, Lord. That now that Thanksgiving holidays are over with, God, that we wake up tomorrow morning just as thankful for, to you and for you as we were a couple of days ago. And God, Many months from now, in the middle of summer, we just pray that we're just as thankful then, God, as a church, as individuals, as families, Lord, because there is always something to be thankful for in this life, God, and that is you. And we thank you so much for who you are and that you, you sent your son to die on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, off to our hymn this morning, number 790. Let's all stand.
sinners to repentance. Amen. All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 13. Thank you, Charlie Choir. Musicians, sound folks, good job this morning. Luke, chapter 13, we're going to read the first 17 verses. Have that in your copy of Scripture. Would you please stand and honor the Word of God? And I'll read for us this morning. Luke records and says, There were present that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and kill them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called, to her, called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. 
And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Thank you. May be seated. I um, have been trying to make an attempt, and I'll try to do it one more time, or I won't be one more, it'll be more than one more time, but um, I, I want you, when you pick up your Bible, or you hear the Bible read, or, or, or hear it sung, I want you to, to have an amazement and a wonder for the book that we have before us. I, I sometimes think we have become so used to thinking about the Bible that we forget how wonderful and miraculous and amazing book that you hold in your hand there. And I think once we come to that conclusion, uh, we will have a, 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 a more of a desire uh, to come and to read this book. Now, we're reading out of the book of Luke uh, this morning. There are four Gospels that are given to us, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Two of the authors are, are eyewitnesses, Matthew and John. Two of them are not, Mark and Luke. And so here the Bible is being written in the same time period by these four different individuals. Remember, in the day and age in which they were written, there was no email, there was no Facebook, uh, there was no Snapchat, there was no CNN News, Fox News, uh, there was no communication from one a part of a region to another except by, if you think the U.S. mail is snail mail, in that day the Roman road mail was snail, snail, snail mail. And, uh, and so here the Bible is being written across a wide, vast region from Alexandria in Egypt to Rome in Italy, from Babylon in Iraq to uh, over in Spain. Uh, and, and these folks were living in these areas, and they were writing the accounts for whatever reason they chose to do so that would become the inspired Word of God. Do you realize how easy it would have been for one of these folks, if it was just a human authorship, it was just a human book, to have written something that was uh, uh, not correct with something another one of them had written. So here we have four guys writing, two of them uh, writing out of the eyewitness accounts of other folks. Mark uh, most likely is using Peter's uh, eyewitness account. He, was a, he went along with Peter a good bit, and his writing is like that, so we, we pretty well know that Peter was his source. And Luke tells us in the very first part of the book of Luke, you, you can or cannot turn back and just read one verse, it says, in his first, uh, Luke 1, 1 says, Inasmuch as we have taken in, in hand to set in order a narrative of the things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word of God delivered them to us. So he's saying, I got my sources from many folks. He taught probably to Mary. Uh, when you read the account that he gives us, uh, only Mary could have given us some of that information. He gets some of his account, of course, from Paul. Paul is one of the folks that he travels with and uh, helps uh, writes the book of Acts, uh, Luke does. Uh, he probably got uh, some of his information from Peter and some from other of uh, those that were eyewitnesses that he went, listened to them. And listen how then uh, Luke writes. He writes in such a way that, that it is as if his conviction so that he is seeing those things himself. When we read the passage I read to you this morning, he's not saying, well, maybe these guys were right. He's writing this as if he was sitting there in the presence where these things were happening. So here you have over this vast array of space, distance, you have four different men writing an exact account that complement each other and uh, uh, show no uh, uh, data at all of difference. Well, I'm not just talking about the, the content, I'm talking about historical data. Things that were happening in places and times that are verifiable. Uh, when you begin to, to, to grasp that, you realize the book that you have set before you is in itself a miraculous book. It, it, it speaks, it identifies itself. There is no other book in the world like it. Not the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Quran. Uh, uh, of uh, the Islamic world, 
not the Mishnah, the Verda of the, uh, of the uh, Buddhist worlds. None of those books compare at all to the integrity of the book you have before us. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because I understand that sometimes we, we have a, a faith that we believe but sometimes there's uncertainty in this intellectual world in which we live in. Sometimes we say, boy, I believe what I believe, but I'm not certain I want other folks to know I believe what I believe. There's sometimes this uncertainty among believers that they can't 100% count on all that they've been told. And the reason for that is they have not searched the scriptures to find in them the truth. They don't see what I'm trying uh, to, to explain to you this morning that you have a verifiable record that is unlike any other group of folks of any religious matter in the world that you can take and you can look at and when they look at you and say well why would you believe something like that you have the record before you you have the Bible that you can say why wouldn't someone believe that why wouldn't you take a, a book that was able to be put together by the Holy Spirit, uh, these different men, different backgrounds, different places, different times, and yet they perfectly accord with each other, not only in just theological matter, but historical data and all other that goes with it. You have a most marvelous book. We, we need to understand that, and I think we need to uh, have a faith that grows up out of that. The Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God. We have that before us. Nobody else, no other religion, no other group of folks can come close to saying that, brothers and sisters. And so we can come with confidence to this Word. It speaks truth to us. You don't have just an a, 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 a unsure, unsteady uh, word. You have the sure, the Bible says, word of God. We need to cling to that. We need to come to that conclusion. I'm telling you this, folks, because here we're studying today in the book of Luke, and Jesus has just brought up a subject that ought to be near and dear to every one of you because you live in that day when I believe it's very possible these truths are going to be true. He began to explain that there were two comings, that he was there, that he was going to leave, but he was coming back. And uh, the, the Bible here is recording for us that first event, but just as certainly as it was here the first time, the Bible says we can be absolutely certain because we have the sure word that Jesus is coming back for his church. And you live in those days. Isn't that amazing? You say, how do I know that? Because I read the Bible. Now, I don't, cannot tell you that he's coming back today. I don't know if he's coming back tomorrow. I don't know if he's coming back this week, next month, or this year. But I can tell you for certainty that he is soon returning to planet Earth. You, you can bet on that, uh, and you can hang your life on that. And so Jesus begins to do that, and he says to those folks, thinking about that, that the, the Lord is coming back to receive his own and to himself, he says, now what you need to do is make certain that you are his own. The glorious hope that you and I have, that the day that we can come together and band as believers, is that we know Jesus as our Savior, we've trusted Him as our personal Lord, and therefore when He comes, we will go and be there where He is. That's our hope. We have a, a sure hope that we will not be left behind, but that we'll be caught up with Jesus and spend the eternity with Him. Or peradventure, one of us were to pass before that time comes, we have a certain hope that we would go to heaven and we would await that soon coming uh, return of the Lord, and then we would be reunited with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and then we too would live with them forever. That's our hope. That's the joy. That's the reason we ought to come to church in celebration. We ought not to come in church out of obligation, though I think sometimes obligation is a good thing, but it ought to at some point change from obligation to celebration. When we begin to understand that this is just not a tradition, your faith is a living part of who you are. And God is the God that you worship and adore and love. That's what he's telling them. And he's saying you need to be sure that you have separated tradition, religion, from relationship. We need to make sure 
that we have actually come to that place that we've called on him and uh, that we know him as our Savior. And I trust and hope and believe that most, if not all of you, have done that. If not, I would encourage you to, to cast your care upon him, to come to him. He loves you. You're going to see that in the message this morning uh, as it unfolds for us, that there's a God. He is not sitting in heaven at this moment in judgment on you. God is sitting in heaven with a loving care, wanting you to come to him, inviting you to come knowing the things that are wrong with us, knowing our faults, knowing our uh, misgivings, knowing all the things that are in our life that would, uh, in our thought process, exclude us from coming to know Him. He knows about that already, and yet He has offered whosoever will may truly come and partake of all that God has, not because of who you are, what you did or did not do, because of who He is, because He loves you. If there's a message from Thanksgiving to Christmas that ought to resound from the pulpits of the church of God is that God is in this moment sending forth His love. For the Bible says God loved you, sent His Son to die for you that He might could have a relationship with it. It is not God's desire to punish anybody in this room. Did you know that? It is not God's desire. Now I want to tell you, be honest with you, if you leave this world without Christ, he will punish you. I'm not trying to minimize that at all. You listen to me preach this period of time. You know that. But I'll tell you, the overriding characteristic of God is love. God cares for you, he loves you, and he wants you. So uh, Jesus bringing that forward, he begins to talk with them. And he uses three in this, ser- in this passage this morning, this sermon, he usually uses three different examples to teach folks what they need to know to come to know him. The first is this two-part thing here. He says there's two things to them. And he says, and what he's trying to point out uh, to the folks here is, you are assuming that God is judging on folks because misfortune happens to them, and he is not judging you because misfortune is not happening to you. And that is a wrong assumption. Do not think because God is good in blessing you and things are going good in your life that your goodness somehow makes you right with God. And do not think because bad things may be happening to some folks, do not think they have necessarily done something bad and therefore God is judging them. He uses two examples. He says, what about these Galileans that came to the temple to worship? Now, Galilee was um, a rough place. It's the place where Jesus spent most of his ministry. Uh, it had many folks that had risen up in rebellion against Rome, and Rome constantly was in the process of putting down these rebellions. There was a, a Galilean, Judas of Galilee, and he had gathered up a company of several hundred folks, and he had caused great pain upon uh, the uh, Roman uh, army and the Roman uh, Empire at that time over in the region of Galilee. And Pilate uh, found uh, some of these Galileans in Jerusalem, uh, they had come. Now, he doesn't know if they are of the Judas group or not, but he's going to make an example of them. And they come and they're offering their sacrifices there at the temple in Jerusalem. He sends his soldiers in and murders <coughs> those worshipers there in Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus takes that example and says, Now, do you think God was judging those through Pilate because they were bad? <coughs> and the answer is, well, there's no indication of that. Jesus says, no. He says, unless you repent yourselves, worse than this could happen to you. Now, they were standing there in their Sunday morning clothes. They had their Sunday morning smile on. They were, they were you know, had their halos all shined up. And Jesus looks at them and says, now, I know in your heart you think that they were judged because of, uh, of the things going on in Galilee. He says, don't look at it like that. That's not how you ought to look. By the way, as a aside, most of uh, the commentators, those uh, that, that I read behind, believe this is where the rift came between Pilate and Herod. Remember, remember uh, the r- record of Jesus' crucifixion shows that there's a rift between the two, and it's healed uh, through the crucifixion process. And see, the Galileans were in the territory of Herod, and it was Herod's job to deal with them. Well, Pilate took it on himself here to slay uh, these Galileans there in the temple in Jerusalem, and that caused some friction over whose authority was where. <clears throat> You don't need to know that. And so um, just just interesting part of the Bible. And so, uh, <clears throat> so uh, here he says, or take, for instance, these folks at the Tower of Siloam. Now, Siloam uh, was there where the uh, Beth- Beth- Bethesda was, the pools where folks would come for healing. <clears throat> and uh, 
and they were already naturally looked upon because they had infirmities that they must have sinned or some of their family must have sinned. And evidently one of the towers, there's no record in history of this, as there probably would not be, one of the smaller towers there had fallen and killed 18 of these folks. And again, the Jewish mind assumed mm -hmm, they got what they deserved. They were sinners, and uh, their infirmity showed they were sinners, and then God just put a capital exclamation point on top of them by letting a, a tower fall and kill them. And Jesus says, no, do not, do not look at life that way. Don't assume those folks were unrighteous and you were righteous. He said, unless you repent yourself, you will perish also. And so Jesus is exposing to their heart uh, the, the, the problem that we all have and we all have a tendency, all of us, to excuse our sins, minimize them, and maximize other folks' sins. That's a natural human condition. I do it. I look at you every Sunday morning and say, look at that bunch of sinners. I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm the preacher. Not really. Not every Sunday morning. And um, so, um, so we, we all have a tendency to do that. It, it is part of the, the nature, the battle that goes on. But, the, but Jesus says, in, a, in view of what I'm telling you, make sure that you're doing a correct examination of your heart so that you will be in a place that God can forgive you and save you. And then he shows uh, through the planting of the vineyard thing, he says, but I want you to understand that I'm a merciful God, I I'm kind, I'm long-suffering. So here comes the vineyard owner, and he comes along and finds this uh, uh, fig tree, and for three years he's come by and he's looked at the fig tree, and it's had nothing. It's not, it's not um, produced any figs. Now, I, I planted, this is not a good example, but the one I have, okay? I planted a fig tree this spring, a little bit of pot of fig tree. Put it in the ground, and uh, it started the very first year, it produced four figs. That's all it could produce because I have squirrels. And this little tree is about this tall. And as soon as that little green fig got there, squirrels began to take my figs away. has nothing to do with the sermon. I'm just telling you what happened, okay? But I know a fig tree can produce figs fairly quickly, or it should. That one was trying. And so, uh, so uh, in three years, it ought to grow and produce figs. And this, this uh, owner was impatient with the fig tree. He looked up at the cultivator and he said, why are you wasting this space? Dig this tree up, throw it in the fire, and put you one there that might produce. But the fellow that was tending the fig trees looked at him and said, let's give it one more chance. Let me take some tender loving care. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. And if it doesn't produce this year, then we'll throw it away. And I want to tell you, that's a picture of how God is in working with us. If we will repent of our sins, if we will trust Him, God is a merciful God. Uh, he will come to us, and even in our stubbornness, uh, even sometimes in our self-will, even when sometimes we refuse to hear and do what God says, God does not just throw you out. Isn't that good? God doesn't just throw you away. God says, no, let's, let's spend a little more tender, loving care. Let, let's fertilize around it. Let's give this a chance. And here the Bible is saying, Jesus is saying to those folks, I think a couple of things. He's saying to you, and I think this is the thing I, I want you to hear most this morning. He's saying to you, don't be so hard on yourself. Know that you're a human being. Know that you have frailties, flaws. See them. Don't hide them. Don't, don't, don't minimize them. See them, take them to the Lord, and let Him deal with them. If you will do that then, God is merciful. He will spend some time in tender, loving care for you. <coughs> and so we see Jesus, as He projects and predicts that He's uh, going to come back and, and, and is telling these folks the things to be prepared, He's telling us. Understand those things. And then the third <coughs> thing He starts talking about here, and these all happen, uh, it appears like in Scripture, pretty much sequentially. They're, they're, they're going right along, so the Sabbath comes along. And Jesus does what Jesus does on the Sabbath. He goes to the synagogue. And uh, in that synagogue, 
he finds this lady that has been bent over with an infirmity for 18 years. This lady is suffering. And we find out part of her suffering is because she has had a demonic uh, oppression or, or even possibly possession upon her. And she's not been able to deal with it. But she's done something, I think, that's very admirable. She hasn't given up on God. She's at the synagogue. She has been coming there for 18 years, and she has found absolutely no relief for her spiritual problem. The Bible makes this fairly clear that her problem was not a physical problem. It was a spiritual problem. And this had her bent over so that she could not stand up. And she was coming to the only place that she knew for help, and that was to, we would say church for our point of view, it was a synagogue, it was a Jewish worship place. And so that day Jesus was there. And the Bible says Jesus looked at her and had pity on her. The word there means he had loving, tender care. He looked at her and said, dear child, you've been coming here for 18 years. And you have a spiritual problem, and yet you haven't found the answer out. The problem is the answer hadn't been provided her there. It was a spiritually dead place. We'll see that in just a second. And so Jesus looked at her, and he says, Honey, I'll give you the South Georgia version. You know, everywhere you go, if you don't know about somebody's name, if you're a female, you call the man, Honey. And if you're a man, if you don't know her name, you call her Baby, right? Doesn't mean anything. It's just a bunch of honeys and babies running loose in South Georgia. And so, uh, and so he says, honey, you're well. And he reaches over and does something that was absolutely amazing. He puts his hand on his shoulder. Now, in the Jewish society, a rabbi, which is who Jesus was, never would have touched a female, much less in a synagogue. It would have been un Unthinkable, but Jesus does unthinkable things. He put his hands on her, and immediately, you know what this lady does? 18 years, the Bible says. It puts emphasis on it. 18 years, and Jesus, in a moment, speaks to her, tells her to stand up, puts his hand on her, and she stands up straight. She was a Baptist, so she said, thank you, Lord, and left. The Bible says she had some spirit in her. She said, she stood up and glorified God. That tells you she had been there seeking she had been wanting help. She needed help. And when she got it, she jumped up and had a Holy Ghost revival. I mean, she said she glorified God. Those men in their turbans, they were, what's going on here? But she didn't care. She said, I've had problems for 18 years, and these turkeys, excuse me, these men, hadn't been able to do anything. And one man came by and he did something. Well, here sat the ruler of the synagogue. Now, here's the reason nothing happened at the synagogue. He sat back and said, whoa, boys. She could have come and you guys could have come on any other day for the Sabbath. It'd be healed, but we got to keep the Sabbath straight. We've got to dot our I's and cross our T's. Needless to say, this woman stood up and glorified God and walked out of the place. Had nothing to do with it. He was more concerned with external matters. He, he was concerned about the decorum of the synagogue. He was less concerned about the people, more concerned about the decorum. And said, what is going on in here? And I mean, he excoriated Jesus for having done such a thing. Jesus stood there and he looked at him and said, well, excuse me, sir. I believe that you, if you had one of your animals uh, on a Sabbath, would have been a Saturday, and an animal needs to drink on the Sabbath. You had rules so that you could let your animal drink water. As a matter of fact, they had good rules. Uh, they had a rule that if you needed to have a backpack on your donkey, suppose you would have to carry something or ride somewhere, you could not put that backpack on that animal on the Sabbath. But if you tied it on the day before the Sabbath, so right before the Sabbath started on Saturday afternoon at 559, you put that saddle, that backpack on your donkey and let him keep it on all night long. The next morning, if you wanted to put a burden on him or if you wanted to uh, 
ride on him because the saddle, the backpack was already on him. You could ride on him. Mm. Or you couldn't tie a halter, Brother Robert, on a camel on the Sabbath. Brother Robert's my resident camel expert. And um, me and him know what we're talking about. And so um, and says, so you, uh, you could put the halter on the camel before the Sabbath started, the day before, and then you could take the halter and lay it in your hand and lead the camel to water if he needed to drink. Or if you had a string of camels, Brother Rob, you could put the halters on the camels on the day before the Sabbath, and you could lead that string of camels to water as long as you didn't twist the reins of the halter. You had to leave them laying straight in your hand so that you had done or appeared to do no work. And with the halter strings laying across your hand flat, you could lead your camels to drink water. And, and that's just the beginning. I mean, they had the rules as much as you want to have rules. And Jesus looked at them and said, you've made all these silly rules about what could be done trying to observe a day that you observe wrongly because you failed to see that the Lord of glory is in your midst. Even when someone is healed in your midst, you're still worried about the itty-bitty things and not concerned about the Lord in your presence. And he tells them uh, that, that their hearts were hardened and because of that, that they would find themselves outside of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, verse 17, he said, and he said these things, and his adversaries, that is, the ruler of the synagogue and the others that were standing there, were put to shame. You know what that means? Their motives were exposed. They were shown for what they really were. They were simply religionist. Cared nothing for the things of God. Cared nothing for the glory of God. They only cared about the external things that were going on and had no heart for the things of God. But finally, look what's here. He says, And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Not the religious rulers, not the folks in charge, but the common, everyday folks that Jesus was touching on a day-in and day-out relationship and they were coming to see him for who he was. He said, those folks rejoiced. It bothers me a bit when folks come to the house of God out of external religious obligation and have no joy in the service of God. This ought to be the place, folks. We are the absolute happiest you can ever be. You're in the house of God. You're here to glorify God. We're here to serve him. He saved us. You have the privilege to smile, to clap your hands, to rejoice before God because we have been redeemed and are on our way to heaven. What a wonderful privilege it is. Listen, they surely as great things were being done by the Lord in the day he walked on planet earth, I want to tell you, when he is walking on the earth through his church today, great and mighty things are being done. God is still touching folks' lives. He is still answering prayers. He is still redeeming the lost. And he still cares with an everlasting love for every person that draws the breath of life. Every one of them. Is that, you, is that your view of who God is? That's the biblical view. That's God's view. That's what Jesus wants us to see. And so I'm asking you today, if you were like Josh, and you were thankful on Thanksgiving, are you still thankful today? Thanksgiving ought to be in the heart of believers every single day of our life. We are the most blessed of all creatures ever to walk on planet Earth. Because God loves you. Isn't that good? You say, well, preacher, I don't know how I got everything done right. Well, I assure you, this leader of the synagogue didn't have everything done right. But God still loved him. 
and he still loves you. You serve him not out of obligation, but you serve him out of celebration. That's what we ought to do. This season of the year between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we ought to make an a, a agreement with ourselves to say, I'm going to celebrate Jesus. He's worth it because he loves me. Father, speak to our hearts. Help us to see the truth that your Bible so plainly puts forward and we sometimes so muddy up. And that is, you love your children. And you love everyone. You care for those even that have not come yet and place their faith in you. And until they draw their last breath, you're going to be loving and calling them to yourself. Father, for that one that sits in this room this morning and feels unworthy, I pray this morning you might say, Child, you may feel unworthy, but I love you. I care about you, and I want you. Speak to our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name.